Greetings, programs. This is Wretch, and welcome back to Vampire the Masquerade Parliament of Knives. I really enjoyed the first stream and chapter of this series, and I'm glad that you guys did too. And now we're going to move on to chapter two, Misgivings, and see what trouble Silas gets into. Now, um, before we do that, though, I'm going to go ahead and look at our stats and see name Silas, Clan Nosferatu. We have two hunger right now. Ruthlessness, 42%. Cordial, 48%. Subversive, 55%. Loyal, 45%. Or 5545. Skills. Oh, wow. Wait. That's all we have. They narrowed it down to, like, percentages. That's interesting. 32% strength, 47 dex, 24 stam, 30% charisma, 23% manipulation, 41% composure, intelligence 20%, wits 31, resolve 31. I wonder how this um, resolves roles. We got our reputation here. Okay, not what I expected. Still, it's different than uh, Night Road and um, Out for Blood, so it definitely has potential. Let's get into this now. I also went ahead and changed the windows guy or the window guys. Um, I think I did this during the first episode, but everything, including the choices, should show up here on the screen for you guys too. This inhospitable land of ice and snow ill suits me. My waking hours are plagued by chill reception in climate as well as the demeanor of my Camarilla hosts. Prince Arundel risked much by opening his city to me, and until such night as the terror of Oroshogi releases his grip on precious Alamot, I shall remain indebted to the Ottawa Ventru for their grudging hospitality. The rise of the Black Shepherd has resulted in unsettling new alliances I once have believed unthinkable. Kashif Salik, Banu Hakim Vizier. Uh, the Banu Hakim uh, used to be the Asamite clan. Hello there. The grinning face of Robert Ward stares up at you, all blocky alabaster teeth filled in perfect rows like tombstones. There's an anger behind those dead eyes, but it's largely subverted by a mirthful quirk of his lips. His shirt is unbuttoned and his crossed arms are laced with sinewy muscle. For the second time in as many days, this man has caused you no small amount of difficulty. Although, were you given the option, you'd doubtless repeat today's misfortune over the events of the previous night. You massage your temples with your thumb and forefinger as you place the Anarch Renegade's file back on your desktop. When mortals prattle on about their vampiric myths, they rarely suggest that an undead, too, might be afflicted with such trite concerns as stress headaches and a sinking stupor of boredom. From the moment you greeted her in the early hours of the night, your sire had been beside herself with irritation at the botched warehouse raid. It wasn't so much the dressing down that disturbed you, however. It's the fact that she apologized to you in the aftermath. Eden Corliss never apologizes to anyone, let alone a child who disappointed her. But she hid herself in her office. She handled, handed you several file folders and instructed you to review their contents. Still recovering from your disbelief, you missed her instructions entirely and she had to repeat them with a snarl. No further apologies were forthcoming. Your desk sits to the left of a massive set of double doors leading to Corliss's private office, walls of striped marble rising on either side to an impressive peak. Voices above a hushed whisper have a tendency to echo throughout the chamber at dizzying frequencies which unnerve you as much now as they did when you first set foot here, your naive eyes wide as they took in the opulent splendor. On a typical visit to Corliss's office, your sire requires little of you aside from the occasional clerical duties she couldn't entrust to her buzzing hive of worker bees. You often wondered if the dreary task were merely her way of asserting dominance over the younger generation, but you have to admit to yourself that the constant stream of reports on Ottawa's kindred community have been useful to keep an eye on. In modern nights, knowledge can be a deadly weapon. You thumb through the reports. There must be at least one on every important member of Ottawa's kindred community. Primers on these important kindred are now available in your stats screen. Stats.
Uh, maybe the Camarilla? Notable Kindred of Ottawa. Let's get to it. Prince Arundel, Eden Corliss, Sheriff Key, uh, Jordan Tremblay, Michael Bouchard, or Bucard, Vivian Mayer, Kashif Salik, Alicia Gray, Henrik Lang, Robert Ward. Well, I guess we probably need to read some of these, don't we? Just to get a little bit of intel. Ooh, look at that. Our distinguished leader, Clan Ventru. Embraced several centuries ago, Arundel assumed the name of his mortal birthplace in an attempt to ret retain a portion of his humanity. Few kindred know his birth name, and if they do, they aren't telling. He is the first prince of Ottawa to survive the incessant Sabbat incursions on Canada's capital city from nearby Montreal. Arundel assumed command after the erstwhile Tr Prince Cranston's ambitions ended with her meeting final death at the hands of those she thought to be allies. As Cranston Seneschal, Arundel narrowly escaped the ambush's flames with the help of the Nosferatu Key. After numerous kindred fled Ottawa in the wake of attacks from Montreal, Arundel rebuilt the local Camarilla from the ground up, recruiting from those he trusted as well as attracting from unusual elements, emulating the governing style of his former mentor, London's Valerius. He offered incentives to the Bruja of Kitchener and Cambridge as well as the Gangrel of southwestern Ontario to consolidate power and hold the city against attack. His sharing of political capital enraged many of his supporters among the Ventru, causing them to withdraw their support. He was only able to retain his grip on the domain with the help of Eden Corliss and Key, whom he raised to Seneschal and Sheriff, respectively. When Montreal was scoured clean by First Light as part of the Second Inquisition, Ottawa transformed overnight from a desperate enclave into a burgeon, or burgeoning metropolis that attracted kindred from all over the globe. Elder Kindred rode high on the wave of sudden popularity, gaining wealth and influence. Arundel has also managed to enrich himself in the process, elevating his tech firm to be one of the most lucrative businesses in Canada. During these early years of prosperity, Arundel grew close with the Bruja Robert Ward, a friendship that was said to have raised the ire of his seneschal, Eden Corliss. When most of Clan Bruja violently broke with the Camarilla following the Conclave of Prague, Arundel reportedly pleaded for Ward to stay with the Camarilla. Why he felt so strongly about the matter is the focus of wild speculation among Ottawa elders. When the Bruja left to join the Anarchs anyway, reports from Corliss suggested that Arundel was inconsolable for at least a week before reappearing as if nothing had happened. In recent nights, Arundel opened his domain to Banu Hakim refugees led by the vizier, Kashif Salik. As Corliss wisely predicted, the move proved quite controversial. When Arundel refused to retract his offer of sanctuary, the majority of Clan Tremere left Ottawa and retreated to their former home in Quebec City, even behind only their primogen Lang as a representative. Mere weeks ago, Prince Arundel suddenly disappeared from public view and hasn't been seen since. Rumors of his whereabouts fly furiously around the court, with suggestions ranging from assassination to a mysterious pull Elder Kindred have felt in recent nights termed the Beckoning, which inexpertly draws its targets to a war with the Canites in the Middle East. I like these. Let's go with uh, Eden Corliss. Hello, sire. Clan. Nice looking Nosferatu. Nosferatu, in a world of high-powered business, Eden regularly uses her advanced levels of the obfuscate discipline to assume the face of another woman, at least while she's in public. Embraced centuries ago in Birmingham, England, Eden Corliss has a long-held habit of laying low and working from the shadows, earning her the nickname The Spider. She witnessed Arundel's rise to prominence after he was selected to work under Regent Valerius in London and silently marked him as a kindred of interest. I actually know the character of Valerius. Um, he was Regent and basically, I believe, held a good portion of London intact um, when Mithras disappeared, the prince, um, in London by Night, which was an amazing um, set of VTM books set in Victorian London. Like, if you ever decide to get some of the older, like, third edition style VTM books, I cannot recommend the Victorian Age vampire books enough. They were amazing. At Eden's suggestion, Arundel abandoned London before Valerius's master Mithras returned in the late 1800s, sparing both of them from the powerful Methuselah's wrath. 
They arrived in the United States a decade after the American Civil War, before relocating to Ontario shortly after Canada's Confederation. Not long after Arundel took proxy over Ottawa, Corliss was elevated to Seneschal due in large part to her display of loyalty in defending the prince from political uprising with his, within his own clan. Since then, she has supported the majority of his political choices, although she spoke against his association with the rabble of the Bruja and the feral Gangrel, her concerns stemming from Arundel's emulation of Valerius's policies which led to his downfall in London. Corliss has sired three children since her arrival in Ottawa, you, Luca Taylor, and Nathaniel Harris. Permission from Arundel given with unusual frequency has led to grumbles of favoritism in the Primogen Council. In recent nights, Corliss publicly disagreed with Arundel over his decision to welcome the refugee Banu Hakim into Ottawa's Camarilla society, and then she refused to condemn the Tremere when they left the city in protest. Of course, she was far from the only prominent kindred to disagree with the decision, but her closeness to Arundel made the schism that much more interesting to the usual rumor mongers. The Sheriff. We're just going to go down the line. Why not? Ooh. Now we know him very well. Clan Nosferatu. Sheriff Key arrived in Ottawa in 1977 at the request of the former Prince Cranston as a co-conspirator in her coup against then Prince Jonah. Jonah had failed miserably in his attempts to take Montreal from the rival Sabat, leading to the destruction of several kindred as well as innumerable valuable ghoul servants. Unfortunately, Cranston followed in her predecessor's footsteps when her overconfidence resulted in an ambush that led to her destruction. Key managed to, to save only one member of the prince's party, Cranston Seneschal Arundel. Shortly after Arundel ascended to the office of prince, he offered the position to, of sheriff to Key, which the Nosferatu gratefully accepted. Key is fiercely loyal to his prince and will stop at nothing to discover where he has disappeared to. Is it Key or we? Can someone help me with that? You have to see how that's pronounced. Jordan Tremblay. Oh, Lord. Yep, that's a Malkavian. Embraced in 1968, Jordan gained the attention of her sire as a prominent protester of the Vietnam War in the streets and campuses of New England colleges and universities. After being followed from protest to protest by a shadowy figure, Jordan eventually gave in and confronted her stalker, leading to her unwilling embrace. Whether or not her sire agreed with Jordan's ideals is unknown. All she can remember from her first nights of unlife is a babbling torrent of words from her sire as she desperately attempted to explain Jordan's part in a grand conspiracy involving aliens. Jordan managed to escape her sire with the help of a gangrel named Melody. Wishing to leave the United States and its war behind them, both kindred fled to Canada under the guise of draft dodgers. During their journey, Jordan had several extremely lucid visions of a future with terrified her. Though the, the thought that she would go crazy like her sire was a constant fear that Melody was able to put to rest by explaining the nature of Malkavians. Jordan eventually settled in Ottawa and said goodbye to Melody, who intended to meet up with other gangrel in Western Ontario. Oh, there's our boy. Ricard, Clan Nosferatu. Little is known about the origins of the powerful Nosferatu primogen, though rumors have circulated among neonates for years that he was embraced during the War of 1812, these tales have been widely discredited by local elders who are well aware that Bucard is likely significantly older than he wishes to let on. More reasonable estimates place Mikkel's embrace in the early 1600s during the French colonization of North America. Picard and the erstwhile Nosferatu Prince Cranston came to blows over territory in Ottawa's sewer system before Cranston's destruction. Or, and before Cranston's destruction, she amassed a detailed dossier of Picard's past, suggesting he had been embraced not long after the founding of Quebec City, then capital of New France. Unfortunately, the veracity of these claims are nearly impossible to verify after Cranston's destruction at the hands of Montreal's Sabat. If the dossier survived, it is doubtlessly among Prince Arundel's personal belongings. Uh, Picard is an undisputed master of the sewers and tunnels running below the busy streets of Ottawa, and he manages a list of those who access his domain and what they do while they're there via an extensive system of cameras and surveillance equipment. 
While Mikkel himself is distrustful of modern technology, he employs a network of human and neonate servants to catalog the recordings and tabulate them on paper for his records. So everything that we do in his uh, sphere of influence is going to be recorded. We need to know that. Keep that in mind for future reference. Vivian Mare. Ben True. Rumored to have lived in Ottawa since its incorporation in the mid-1800s, Vivian Mayer is said to all but control the moral cop politics of Canada. Her influence runs deep, with strings firmly attached to prominent members of both the Conservative and Liberal parties. Recent rumors suggest that she has infiltrated both the NDP and Bloc Quebec. Sorry for butchering the French as well, giving her near total dominance over Canadian kind's political landscape. Vivian's eye for detail and meticulous business sense made her the logical choice as Ottawa's unofficial harpy, arbiter of disputes over status and debt, as well as de facto diplomat for relations with the Middle Eastern vampires known as Yeshira. Note that the notorious information network Shreknek has been uh, dismantled. It has been suggested that no other kindred in Ottawa has amassed a larger treasure trove of data regarding the domain's inhabitants than Miss Mayor. Another thing to bring up when you hear Shreknet a lot of people tend to think the movie Shrek. Um, they're actually taught. It's actually a reference to Mac Shrek, who um, played Count Orlock in the original black and white Nosferatu. While she abides by no explicit alliances, Vivian is known to have been close with Arundel even before he became prince. While many have speculated that the two had been lovers, they have each denied this on several occasions, insisting that their relationship is strictly professional. Kashif. Ooh, I love this artwork. It's key? Okay, excellent. Clan Banu Hakim. Kashif Salik was welcomed into Ottawa by Prince Arundel after he fled the Banu Hakim's ancestral home. He spent the last six months acclimating to the vastly different political atmosphere, which he's found as difficult to adapt to as the cold Canadian climate. Many kindred in the city distrust him and find his insistence on waking during the day to pray toward Mecca strange and illogical, possibly even insane. The Tremere strongly opposed Kashif's welcome into Ottawa's Camarilla Circle, and they abandoned the city in protest, leaving Henrik Lang, their shantry keeper, as their sole presence in Ottawa. Like many of his clan, Kashif has a strong sense of justice, and he finds himself bewildered by the inability of his Camarilla host to rein in the anonymous threats he receives on a regular basis, which he assumes are delivered by the furious Tremere. He has since formed an unexpected friendship with Ophelia, the Malkavian primogen, or primogen, who took an almost immediate liking to him. So, um, what he was talking about at the beginning of Chapter 2, Earl Shoggy, and I don't know how that's actually pronounced, but um, Earl Shoggy is an incredibly powerful Methuselah, or at that time the Asami clan. I'm going by third edition knowledge. That when he woke up, whew, it caused all kinds of, or when it woke up, caused all kinds of chaos um, within the Asami clan. Alicia Gray. Hello there. Clan Toreador. In life, Alicia was a burlesque performer who attracted the attention of her sire through intense devotion to her art and tendency to push boundaries. Her sire, a female kindred socialite with an appetite for young female kind, was entranced by Alicia's pushing of LGBT boundaries in the late 1800s world, where such things were considered obscene and punishable by jail time. During the rise of the internet in the early 1990s, Alicia created her own sex-positive, feminist-friendly porn studio laying claim to a number of hot online domains. The revenue allows her to live a lavish lifestyle and provides her with a number of well-cared-for and willing vessels to slake her thirst and that of her associates. Her primary influence is as the keeper of Elysium, within the walls of the exclusive Rideau Club. Often dismissed by kindred outside her own clan, Alicia is, or Alice, or, yeah, Alicia is actually quite savvy when it comes to business dealings, and while she doesn't currently dominate the financial landscape, she is poised to make an absolute killing in upcoming markets. I like to think Silas is just sitting here, just learning the power players, you know? Henrik Lang. Now, I'm curious about this being a Tremere. Um, not, no picture, really. All right. A fierce Tremere traditionalist and scholar of ancient magics and esoteric texts, Henrik Lang origin, originally set up shop in Quebec City after Prince Annabelle built a powerful chantry there in the 1980s. 
In the 2000s, he was sent to establish a Tremere presence in Ottawa. He crafted a chantry beneath St. Alban's Anglican Church, utilizing the historical building as cover and taking it over fully after the church fractured in 2008. After a coalition of Second Inquisition agencies destroyed the prime chantry in Vienna, the clan's hierarchy fell apart. Lang has since fought tirelessly to hold his clan together like the old days before bonds were broken. Lone wolf, mercenary maguses have a way of disappearing not long after setting foot in Ontario or Quebec, and there is little doubt among the other elders as to who is responsible. Prince Arundel has been largely content to let the Tremere squabble among themselves and allows Lang to operate autonomously as long as he doesn't interfere in official Camarilla affairs or break the masquerade. With his structure and ideological framework crumbling around him, Lang is unusually sensitive to changes in local operations, and thus opposes the rise of House Karna and the admittance of the Banu Hakim into the Camarilla. When Arundel granted sanctuary to Kashif Salik, the Banu Hakim vizier, Lang did what for him was formally unthinkable. He rocked the boat. Under his advisement, the Tremere from his chantry left for Quebec City in protest, vocally opposing the welcome of their old enemies to Ottawa. According to official records, only Lang remains now, holding the chantry for the day that his fellows are able re to return triumphant. And then finally, who we were reading about before, Mr. Lang. During the peak of the Industrial Revolution, and Bruja, of course, Robert Ward was a champion of workers' rights in England, abdicating better wages and working conditions, as well as promoting robust education for the lower classes. These efforts brought him to the attention of a powerful elder in the learned clan who reached out to Robert and offered him the embrace in 1840. In his first years as a fledging, fledgling, Ward let his newfound power go to his head and lashed out in a series of violent assaults against business owners and strikebusters. When he was rebuked for the attacks and threatened with final death, he was able to listen to reason and continue with more peaceful efforts. He left for Canada in the late 1800s, along with a half dozen other Bruja to settle in the small city of Kitchener, Ontario, then known as Berlin. When Arundel became Prince of Ottawa and opened the city's doors to the rabble, Robert was thrilled to gain access to such an influential group of kindred. What he found upon arrival was a deep-seated prejudice against his clan, and while he worked tireless tirelessly to win over minds, he was often drawn into physical confrontations when his blood got heated. The, this, unfortunately, only served to undermine his calls for equality. When the majority of Clan Bruja violently broke with the Camarilla following the Conclave of Prague, Ward was forced to choose between Arundel and the Anarchs, which were fighting for the principles he believed in. In the end, there was only one choice he could make. Camarilla was dangerously broken. The only way forward was a clean split to join the Anarchs and enact the change by any means necessary. All right. Good stuff, good stuff. Return to the game. You lean back in your chair, grateful for the quiet that nighttime work provides you. You imagine the building during the day, swarming with hundreds of mortals all going about their agendas. Then you look down at the flies again and drum your fingers along the edge of the desk. Maybe the constant buzz of businessmen and women would be preferable after all. Lex stirs inside a small pouch at your side, and you slip him a small piece of cheese to tide him over until you're able to set him free. You stare up at the ceiling, unsure whether or not it's safe to leave and go about your night, or if Corliss expects you to remain here until she tells you otherwise. Since the Camarilla ordered an online communications blackout, your nights here have become dreadfully dull. Of course, after watching footage of the Second Inquisition's attack on Vienna, you understand why such precautions are warranted. Once the mortal inquisitors find a kindred domain, they stop at nothing until every last vampire is wiped out. Your mind drifts back to the hunt. How might you have dealt with the Anarch infestation if you were in charge? Hmm. Let's see here. Let's look at our options. This is going to be a good thing kind of toward how I'm going to deal with problems. Ruha and Gangrel clans were officially a part of the Camarilla and not all that long ago. 
immediate violence may not have been the best idea. Send a team to convince them to leave peacefully. Um, for me, from what I'm seeing right now, it would be a a chain a, a choice between this top one and the bottom one. We should have been smarter and quieter. A small strike team might have been able to sneak in and destroy Ward without ever alerting the mercenaries if we'd had the proper intelligence. So I'm actually I'm down with either of those. Vito, do you guys have any strong preference one way or the other? Evens the first one. Okay. I went ahead and rolled a d20. I was going evens the top one, odds the bottom. So um, I rolled an 18. So let's go ahead and just go with this. It's also true. Like, if this is like an immediate thing, we probably could have went, hey, leave. And if that didn't happen, then we would have sent the strike team. Ooh. You're shaken from your thoughts as the entry door slams open, revealing one of the city's most recent arrivals, a vampire of the Banu Hakim clan. Takes you a moment to remember his name, and despite the fact that we just read his dossier, and by that point, he's already torn his way through the room in a storm of scowls and swirling robes. Greetings, Mr. Salek, you say solemnly, doing your best to reset the room to a sense of proper decorum. What can I do for you? I must speak with Seneschal Corlys, the vizier replies, wringing his tightly clasped hands. He smells musty, like old books, and his short black hair is unkempt. You imagine he hasn't groomed himself for several nights. It seems like he must have something important to tell my sire, but I shouldn't let him in without asking why he's here. The vizier wrings his hands before schooling himself to a modicum of calm. I must speak with her regarding the absence of our prince, he says reluctantly once he realizes you're not going to simply let him in without proper reason. His lack of oversight seems to have emboldened certain factions which Arendelle has forced into submission. You have to admit, that does sound serious. Perhaps you should check with your sire and see whether or not you should admit him. Please wait for a moment while I announce you to the Seneschal, you reply. As I'm sure you understand, given recent events, she's quite busy. He waves you on in a poor attempt at calm dismissal, and you slip through the double doors into Corliss's office. She looks up at you from a desk, spilling with paperwork and reports. Um... Yes, child. How would, how would he... T how would she talk? Yes, child. I'll, I'll, I'll play around with it. Kashif Salik is requesting an audience. Sounds like he has something very important to report. Corliss quirks an eyebrow. Does it now? A great many things are of import at the moment, child. Least of which are concerns of the Banu Hakim. She sighs. But I was expecting him to show up with the mans. You were right to detain him, but it's best that I deal with the man now rather than leaving him to stew. Send him in. You step aside as the vizier practically marches into the office before dropping into an elaborate bow. It's lovely, it's lovely to see you, Eden, he says as he stands up straight, flashing a nervous smile at the Seneschal. You can tell he's attempting to be charming, and it's obvious that Corliss is having none of it. Welcome to my office, Kashif Salik, she says bluntly. All business. Kashif barely managed to disguise his surprise at seeing Corliss's Nosferatu disfigurements on display. Typically, she wears the face of another woman when taking guests, but she hasn't had time to prepare for an audience. Uh, you've caught me at an improper, inopportune time, so I must request we skip the formalities and cut to the chase. What can I do for you? Apologies, as Sheaf mutters as his eyes sweep the room, looking for a chair. 
There is none. To the point, then, he says with a flash of mild irritation. Last night my servant handed me a sealed letter which he claimed had been given to him by a rather unusual courier. Furtive fellow, eyes like a ferret. The vizier procures a neatly folded page of paper from one of his robes, voluminous pockets, and clutches it at his side. The letter claimed to be from an anonymous Tremere outside of the city, and it went into great detail about how they intended to torture and eventually end me. Now, in most cases, this wouldn't have been entirely unusual given the enmity before the, between the Tremere and the Banu Hakim, but I had been placed under Prince Arundel's protection. Orlis rolls her eyes. And you believe that the prince's favor afforded you the privilege of peace of mind? Have you any idea, Vizier, how many death threats I receive on a weekly basis? Kashif shakes his head. Enough that I no longer read them. My servants simply burn them and make note of their purported authors in a ledger. Kashif seems taken aback, but that doesn't stop him from continuing. When I confronted Lang about his clan member's insult, you did what? Corliss's eyes burn with anger. He insisted that my allegation was absurd and would not suggest I had fabricated the letter in the first place. And what did you expect? Orlis hisses, reasserting control over the room. After the prince offered you protection, most Tremere left Ottawa in protest. It is, is it too much for your fragile ego to know that a single one remains? Does Lang's continued presence so stick in your craw, Vizier? When did your once proud clan grow so fearful and petty? Ooh. Hmm. Now, the thing is, which side should I go with here? Will we best serve with the, with the new kids on the block? Side with the Tremere? Or just say, you know what? Corliss has got the right... The right idea. Hey, King. Hmm. No, I kind of like, you know... The Banu Hakim Viziers have need of the Camarilla's support after fleeing their homeland. I agree with the Prince that they have the potential to be powerful allies, which they do. Refusing powerful alliances on the basis of an old grudge has always seemed like folly to you. One of these nights, the Tremere will come to their senses and realize that unity makes every civilized clan more powerful. Asimites, Assassins, or the Banu Hakim as they're now properly called in the West, have a long and sordid history with the Tremere dating back centuries to 1496, when the Tremere afflicted them with a blood curse to prevent them from feeding off kindred blood, their precious vitae. The Banu Hakim have never forgiven them, and the mutual enmity has run hot ever since. The curse has been lifted for over 20 years now, but it seems some individuals refuse to leave the past in the past. Ashif seems taken aback by Corliss's bluntness, and his right arm twitches involuntarily and twisting into an arcane claw. Orlis raises an eyebrow, and the vizier slowly relaxes his posture. I am neither fearful nor petty, Seneschal, Kashif replies dryly. I merely petitioned the court on my own behalf. I was accepted into this city by its prince under the tradition of hospitality, after which the Tremere voluntarily left the domain in protest. If they now make external threats against kindred within the city, it is, is that not an affront against the prince's domain? The traditions themselves? Back up Kashif, but in a way that'll help Corliss save face. Uh, 
I'm gonna go with this one. Uh, this one was probably gonna blow up in my face because it seems a little too obvious, but... I back up Kashif, but in a way that'll help Corliss save face. We wouldn't want such rumors to run rampant while Prince Arundel is not receiving petitioners. Perhaps an investigation for the court's peace of mind? Kashif smiles, emboldened, and Corliss casts you a cautioning look. Uh, the child knows my will, and though he speaks out of turn, he is correct in his assessment of the situation. An investigation will be undertaken, if only to bring peace to this restless night's. But between the two of us, Vizier, have you not seen through this obvious trickery? Orlis clasps her hands in mock concern. Why would the Tremere play their hands so openly? Far more likely, another is manipulating you against them, using knowledge of your clan's sordid histories. Kashif nods sagely. It is indeed of a possibility, but one which should be investigated. Between this boldness and the growing presence of the Anarchs, I feel that the rumors being passed around the rumors being passed around Alicia may be true. Corliss arches an eyebrow, hands on her hips. That the prince has been called by the beckoning. The chief continues undeterred. Off to the Middle East. By all accounts, the conditions is pandemic. Elders from all corners of the globe are naturally pulled to the Holy Lands to fight in the Gehenna War. Word is, our beloved prince is the latest to be called. Wild speculation, Orlis says with a sniff, but she says it too quickly. Both you and Kashif can sense that the circulation of such a rumor interests her greatly. None saw Rondel leaving the city. Other elders in different cities have disappeared without trace as well, Kashif continues, pushing his luck. The beckoning strikes at random, drawing the elder blood home. Perhaps one night you will see all of us drawn to battle. Pray that such a night does not come soon. Hmm. This is a time to remain quiet and listen. I'm more interested in learning than making alliances at the moment. We were already nice to Khalif a little bit. All are aware of the beckoning, the chief says. Speaking of our prince being called is not to cast aspirations. Only the most powerful feel its pull, and such a rumor honors him. Orlis sighs in an attempt to feign boredom. Enough. I have heard your petition, Vizier. I'll open an investigation to the alleged Tremere threats. Does that satisfy you? The chief nods and drops into a formal bow. My thanks. I am grateful, Seneschal, he says before riding himself and spinning on his heel to face the exit, his multicolored robe swirling. He closes the door softly behind him, leaving you alone with your sire. Orlis waits for several seconds until she is certain that Kashif has left the adjoining room. These rumors concern me, Silas. Have you grown wary of your paperwork? You can't help an involuntary nod. The task is dreadfully dull. Very well, she says. We must begin an investigation to the rumors of Arundel's disappearance. If he was truly beckoned, it would be best to learn everything we can before the accusations begin. Accusations? Of course, child. Don't be naive. In the event of a powerful kindred's mysterious disappearance, blame and suspicion are always certain to follow. In this particular case, I am Ottawa's second in command. If the prince cannot be found, I will assume control of the domain until such time as he returns. The office of Seneschal is not one to take lightly. Arundel handpicked me for the position against the will of the court, and such slights are rarely forgotten. I expect many of those same self-serving licks will work against me in the coming nights. They may have begun spinning their schemes already. You nod in understanding. I must ask, Corliss continues. Have you personally heard rumors about the prince's disappearance? From whom? Well, you've actually heard several mentions of such a rumor, most recently from Corliss's other child, Luca, and your retainer, Gerard. Telling Corliss, Corliss this may ingratiate her to you, but you doubt Luca or Gerard would appreciate your loose tongue.
Oh, I am not throwing a key under the bus or a bus. I'm certainly not going to do that with Gerard. Luca mentioned it to me during the raid, though it sounded like more of a quiet concern than spreading a seditious rumor. Yay. I would have thought the child would have more sense, Corliss says with a sniff. She spent too much time away from the court. Perhaps I should have taken a firmer hand with her. Thank you for informing me, Silas. Your honesty is greatly appreciated. She looks over a sheet of paper on her desk for a few silent seconds before returning her attention to you. Two missions, two children. As my eldest is currently absent, you may choose the remaining assignment will go to Luca. You may ch uh, and the re yeah, you will ch you may choose and the remaining assignment will go to Luca. She holds up her index finger. First, if the prince meant to leave the city in secret, it's likely he would take the sewers. He's far too recognizable. Many blue bloods would never consider such a thing, but Arundel never held himself above us, Nasferatu. I need you or Luca to visit the Premagen, Bokchar, or Bacard in his lair. Question him, gently, about any unusual activity he may have learned about in his domain. Corliss holds up a second finger. Second, I need one of you to speak to one of our elder Ventru at her estate. Vivian Mares was the last one of us to meet with Arundel according to the Prince's personal agenda. Anything she can tell us about that night could be vital to discovering the Prince's location. Hmm. So, which one would be best? Question the Nosferatu? Or go meet the Ventru. I mean, we could get like really, we could get like in deep with our clan. But having the Ventru as a an alliance would definitely be good. Hmm. But also, um,. The card is incredibly old. Who is Vivian again? Can do? Did we have a? Did we have a uh, dossier? Was this the? Oh, okay. She's the one who has like all the politics in the city under. Okay, this is too good of a chance to go do that. Yeah, I think we're gonna jump in this. An important meeting with the Ventru Primogen? Sounds like an opportunity to make a profitable alliance. I'll visit Vivian and her estate. You set off immediately, not realizing until you're several blocks away that you're not entirely certain where Vivian's personal estate actually is. Then again, the night is young, so it's still fairly likely that you'll be able to find her in her offices on Queen Street, and those are easy to get to and almost impossible to miss. Your fingers itch as you grasp for a cell phone that's no longer there. Too dangerous, the prince had said in his decree. While some princes turn a blind eye to cell phone usage, there had been too many breaches of protocol in the city and Arundel clamped down. Hard. In these days of the Second Inquisition, he was probably right, but once you're accustomed to having it, losing access to so much information at your fingertips tips feels like cutting off a limb. You tighten your thick wool scarf and pull your, uh... Toke? Toke? I don't know what that is. Down so only your eyes show through. The disguise works well enough during the harsh Canadian winter to avoid questions regarding your disfigurements, as long as you don't engage in social interactions. Coupled with your supernatural abilities, it makes short walks above ground relatively safe. As you walk several blocks southwest, you're struck by just how many mortals are out and about on the street tonight. The city has been a hive of activity lately, at least as close to Parliament Hill. It takes less than 15 minutes to reach the towering office building secretly owned by one of Vivian's shell companies through a means of financial wizardry you don't quite comprehend. Above the first floor, its soaring walls are a shining plane of mirrored segments, reflecting back the street lights and silhouettes of adjacent buildings. You push through a revolving glass door into a spotless lobby, its marble floors polished and shiny. 
At the front desk, you're greeted by a member of Vivian's staff. Greetings, sir. What can I do for you this evening? She shrinks away as you draw closer and she gets a quick peek at your twisted fingers. The reaction only lasts for a moment, though. She's clearly seen others of your kind. Vivian wouldn't take chances with her frontline staff asking the wrong kinds of questions. I'm here to see Vivian Mayer, you say. Of course, the young woman says, looking down briefly to check something on a computer screen. Your name? Silas Moore. Ah, yes, one of our exclusive clients. She opens a desk drawer and pulls out an old-fashioned old -fashioned Rolodex, flipping through the cards to find your name. And there we are. I apologize for the wait. What is this regarding? Ooh. I've been sent to discuss an important business opportunity. The young woman looks very curious, but manages to bite her tongue before asking any more questions. Uh, very well. Well, I regret to inform you that Miss Mare is not available at the moment. I have, however, been instructed to inform our exclusive clients that she's available this evening at her estate. Shall I call a car for you? You wince in frustration. Delay is irritating, but at least Vivian has a system in place to shuttle her exclusive clients to her home and back. Yes, you respond. Thank you for the offer. A car will be very helpful. The drive to Vivian's estate in Rockcliffe Park is rather pleasant. The driver knows to keep mostly to himself, and you're able to watch the city fly by your window in a blur of streetlights and neon signs. Your destination is an affluent neighborhood, largely cut off from the poorer parts of the city by an abundance of native greenery and the Rideau River. The home is surprisingly understated for a primogen. Your ride takes you up a wide semicircular driveway to approach a large two-story house in light brown brick. Tall, well-maintained trees dot the spacious lawn, and a stone staircase leads you past two potted ferns to the oversized doorway. A butler answers the door with a raised eyebrow. Your name, sir? He intones. Silas Moore. I'm here to speak with Miss Mayor. I do not believe you have an appointment. It's unusual for kindred of station to be held at the front door without being offered the opportunity to step inside. Could this be some sort of slight? Fortunately, your name is familiar to the butler. Miss Mayor has recently concluded unrelated business. I shall inform her of your arrival. Might I request you await her in the foray? Foray? <laughs> I hate that word. Ah. You, oh, where did she come from originally? Was she... I'm trying to get all the voices right. It was weird to trying to do a, even a slight English accent with that kind of Nosferatu... Um, growl. Or whatever it is. Um... Ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, doesn't say. I'm alright with this. You take a seat in the luxuriously furnished front room, oddly wondering just how long you'll have to wait for your meeting. Luckily, it's not long at all. Vivian strolls into the foray at, foyer at a brisk pace before stopping directly in front of you, placing long, slender fingers on hips accentuated by a well-tailored white pantsuit. Everything about her appearance is designed to draw attention at a high-powered business meeting, from her dark hair tied up in a severe bun to the tips of her designer shoes. Silas, she says flatly. I assume you're here for something more than a social visit. It's not a question. What does Eden want from me this time? Okay, well she's getting straight to the point. I'll go ahead and get straight to the point as well. She may like that. The rumors you may have heard are true. Prince Arundel is missing, and I've been instructed to speak to you about your most recent meeting with him. Vivian's eyes narrow. My dear sweet boy, everyone already knows that those rumors are true. You're the sixth to come to me with this information on this night alone. 
Even Eden can't possibly think that she's kept the lid tight on this particular Pandora's box. It's well known that Arendelle visits my home every Saturday evening to discuss mutual affairs over a refined meal. And with his absence from the court since then, it stands to reason I'd be considered a person of interest. Do you have any particular questions, or would you like me to go on about that evening's vintage? Our dear prince bought quite a treat with him that evening. A daughter of foreign royalty. She was a delight. Sounds like quite an extravagant evening. Were you and Arendelle celebrating something? As a matter of fact, we were. You wait for her to go on, but several seconds pass, and no further information seems to be forthcoming. And what was the celebration about? You finally ask. Vivian sighs. We were discussing oil futures with a visiting Ashira from Dubai and bought together a quite a lucrative scheme. Having our fingers in both Ottawa and the Middle East has its advantages, and we have appearances to maintain. Up until recently, we were in the Camarilla... We in the Camarilla knew very little about Ashira. They're vampires with rather strange customs. But their money is good, and sometimes that's all that matters. It's nothing I expect a Nosferatu to understand. While the prince is an equal arbiter in all things, we are close after all, and thus he celebrated my good fortune. That does sound like quite a big deal. Are there any other kindred at your celebration? No, Vivian says flatly. It was a private affair. Only the three of us and our tasty young morsel. So the Ashira was present as well, then? Vivian nods. He was, in fact. But if Eden wants to talk with him, she'll have a difficult time of it. Why is that? He flew back home the next day. So unless she wants to break the prince's online blackout, she'll have to send for him personally. And that could take weeks. You grit your teeth in irritation. <sighs> Couldn't we have mortal representatives talk to each other online? You could, but it's highly discouraged. I'm sure Eden knows this, even if you do not. Besides, my associate overseas is unlikely to respond in the immediate future. The Middle East is a dangerous place these days. The Gehenna War is growing out of control, and with so many elders being compelled, beckoned, to join the fight, it's best for us little fish to stay in our own ponds and reap financial benefits from the chaos, wouldn't you say? Hmm. Sounds like you've got this all figured out, I say admiringly. Are you prone to flights of flattery, boy, or do you have simply misjudged my mood? Vivian says, her mouth twisted as though she tastes something rotten. What I figured out is how to survive in an increasingly smaller world. I suggest you do the same if you wish to complete your first century. There are many among us, she continues, who would have, have us believe that our prince has been beckoned. Remove this power vacuum would be more than mere convenience. The validity of these rumors would seem entirely likely to one who doesn't know Arendelle on a personal level. What do you mean? You ask. What I mean is that Arendelle is not a man with a taste for war, nor is he interested in the politics of the Middle East. If anything, he didn't pay close attention enough, which is how we ended up with that Banu Hakim in our city. You've met Kashif? You nod. It's hard to forget the vizier. Mr. Salik's entrance into Corliss's chambers earlier this evening. A dreadful business that cost Arendelle the support of the Tremere. Many seem to have forgotten the days of the assassin's wanton diablerie. I have not. I have a very, very long memory, child. She reaches for a white fur-lined coat on a discreet hanger near the front door, clutching it tightly between thin fingers. I do hope I have been of some help to you. She slips each arm into the coat delicately. 
give Eden my best. And with that, you're dismissed, offhand as though she were the one to summon you. Vivian disappears out the door without another word, and when you move to catch up with her, the butler slides into the intervening space like a ghost. Or, like a ghost. Shall I inform your driver that you're ready to depart, sir? That would be excellent. Thank you. Very good, sir. The ride home passes in a blur as you ponder the implications of Vivian's words. She'd been surprisingly forthcoming in places she did, hadn't needed to be. You reminded yourself that everything someone like Miss Mare says, and especially what she does not, is calculated down to the last syllable. You'll have to think critically before choosing what to pass on to your sire. When you reach the city proper, you decide to have the driver drop you off on a slow-moving side street several blocks from your haven. The brisk air and short walk will give you time to think, to clear your head and avoid blundering into any hidden pitfalls. When two elders clash, it's their servants and children that are most likely to feel the sting of final death. You have no intention of being caught in the crossfire. Even if it weren't for your acute sense of time and the tint of the sky, you can always tell it's growing closer to first light by the flow and energy of the city's people. The early risers purchasing coffee, the middle-aged wage, wage, wage slaves grumbling about work under their breath, shops that were closed overnight showing signs of rumbling back to life. Sunrise will soon be upon you. You should return to your haven before reporting to Corliss, which will be understandable given the lateness of her request. You're still a few minutes walk away from the proper back alley sewer entrance when a well-muscled arm shoots out from the dark of a nearby alley and plucks you off the street with a supernatural force. You attempt to cry out, but a meaty hand curls over your mouth, stifling any call for help. Anger is boiling within. You reach for your concealed handgun as the shock of your abduction wears off, and you recognize your assailant as the, Rob as the Bruja, Robert Ward. He puts up a finger to a pair of chapped and split lips. Um, I'm going to change his voice because we didn't know that he was British or he was from England. So. Silence, Silas. I'm not here to hurt you. I just couldn't risk you calling out. I'm not going to let you go now. Or I'm going to let you go now. Just promise you'll let me have my say and you're free to go. Everything's gone to hell and you need to know the truth if you want to survive what's coming. Don't yell now. You try to respond with... I don't have a choice, do I? But it comes out in a muffled garble. Ward removes his hand. A gesture of goodwill. Just hear me out, and at the end, if you want to go, I won't stop you. You've got to understand. I didn't bomb that factory. I think the whole thing was a setup from the beginning. You can't help noticing that his other hand is still clamped around your forearm. Well, you're being awfully violent for someone claiming to be innocent. <laughs> Ward laughs. That's the spirit. He removes his hand from your arm, and you briefly consider running to safety before thinking better of it. If you turn to run, his lightning reflexes and strength will make it easy to snap you back up again. That leaves talking or attacking, and even with what skills you possess, fighting off an enemy this powerful is easier said than done. And who knows? Maybe he actually has something of interest to say. And what do you mean this whole thing was a setup? You ask, eyeing him, eyeing him warily. Why would anyone want to set you up when you've already exiled from the city? Seems to me that the damage to your reputation is already done. Ward relaxes visibly now that you've engaged him in conversation. Suddenly, he looks immensely tired and run down. The cocky grin droops from the edges of his mouth, and eyes so recently filled with violent intent dull to an expression of worry. If you didn't know any better, you'd almost think he was sad. <laughs> I was towed away to the construction site on the island, he says. The instructions came through a dead drop I thought was sent by Arundel himself. It had the authentic seal and passcodes that only a prince and I should have known. Once I got dug in, I sent out some feelers, spies if you like, to figure out what the hell was happening. 
No one could reach Arundel, and rumors were already starting that he not or starting that he gone missing. I got a bad feeling and hired some mercs to watch the perimeter while I figured it out. The whole thing didn't pass the smell test. I did some of my gangrel to guard the front line while I started packing, and then you showed up. Well, let's just say I believe you. What could you possibly expect me to do about it? I need you to help me liberate the prisoner Sheriff Key took after your raid. He's innocent. He's only been in the game for a year and he has no idea what I accidentally got him into. They'll destroy him, Silas. And they'll take their time while they pump him for information he doesn't have. So you expect me to walk into the police station with you and break out a prisoner? You ask, your mouth hanging open in disbelief. Even if I were that crazy, we'd never even make it to the cells. The Bruha shakes his head. Not everyone from my clan are shirt or uh, not everyone from my clan are shoot first, ask questions later stereotypes. I have a plan that should pose no threat to you if you follow my instructions to the letter. Hmm. I do kind of want to figure out where this is all going. Didn't know we'd actually side with the Anarchs, but man. Not saying that we're siding with them. But I do... It's weird for someone to be like that honest. You know, it's like, whoa. Okay, I'm listening. What exactly do you have in mind? I'll go along with this plan as long as it doesn't involve me breaking the masquerade or letting Corliss find out I'm involved. Ward's face breaks open into a smile of gratitude. <laughs> Fantastic, he says, leading you out of the alley in a friendly manner. He hunches up under a heavy coat and hat that masks most of his features. You take his cue and walk beside him as he talks, keeping away from any mortals walking the street lest they overhear your plans. The boy's a young gangrel, calls himself Harburg for God knows Harburg for God knows what reason. Barely knew his sire. When his gang of ferals split off from the Camarilla, he was a lost soul, but then he found me. Joined my pack, as he put it. Ward sidesteps an old woman waiting for the bus. He's gonna be scared. That's probably true, you say. Key can be intimidating. Ward shakes his head. I mean he'll be scared of me. The one thing his sire taught him is that weakness won't be tolerated. I almost destroyed him before abandoning him. So he's gonna run. Probably, yeah. So if you see me manhandling him, I just want you to know that I'm not trying to kill him. I'm just trying to get his ass in gear. Won't have time to explain things in the thick of it. You're not making this sound as easy as you suggested, you say. My part? Probably not, Ward admits. But you? It's pretty straightforward. Have any second thoughts? Not yet. But if there are any more pitfalls and you're going to tell me about it that last second, things aren't going to go very well for you. Fair enough, Ward says. You're starting to wonder if the man ever stops grinning. This is what I need you to do. You slap your hands down on the cold granite countertop in front of a bored looking police officer. I need to see Key. Do you have an appointment? No. But I'm on his list. You proffer a card, which take the man takes. He looks it over and gives you a nod. I'll buzz you in. Ooh. Okay. So let's look at our stats here real quick. Dex, our composure is good. Our wits and resolve are good. Um, I'm not a, I didn't, I think explosives require composure, right? 
Yeah. Um, okay, this is probably so dumb, but we're, we're doing this. I need to set up explosives in a far corner of the station where no one will get hurt. Once the distraction sends Key and his guards running, Ward will break in from the opposite side. Rather than turning to Key's office as, you're tol as you told the man at the front desk, you make certain that you're not being watched before you duck around the opposite corner toward the far end of the station, away from the offices and cells. Oh god, we're gonna get picked up by security cameras, aren't we? There, just like Ward described, you find an unused conference room filled with ancient paperwork and broken down office chairs. I think someone would just clean the mess up. Well, after today, they won't have much of a choice. You set up the small explosive device on the floor against the far wall where it's least likely to do actual harm, and arm the mechanism the way the Bruja showed you. There's no clock or countdown meter, but War said you'd have five minutes to get out of the area and over to Key's office. After taking a peek through the partially open door, you exit into the hallway unscathed and unseen, resuming a normal pace as you reach the sheriff's office and knock on the door. Okay, a little bit of stealth. That's what we're that's what Nosferatu are good for. Yes. Key's muffled voice comes from the other side. You try the door, but it's locked. You'll have to wait a few minutes. I'm clearing out some junk and old records. I was supposed to have a clear schedule today. You go over the last part of the plan. <sighs> Plausible deniability. Why were you here in the first place? Ooh, okay, Corliss has me gathering information. I need to ask you a few questions. About the prince. Um, Key could go ahead and ask Corliss about that. It had nothing to do with talking to the sheriff. I need to speak to the prisoner and see if I can get any information from him. Tracking down the Anarchs would be a huge win for Corliss. It would be a win for all of us, not just her. I'm not sure what you're expecting to get from the animal, but I might as well let you have a shot at him. It can't hurt. You hear the lock turn over and Key opens the door. Behind him, his office is in wild disarray. Looks like he wasn't kidding about the reorganization. Not the best timing, he says dry dryly. I guess not. The room rumbles beneath your feet as the explosives you set detonate. Key practically launches himself from the doorframe, dust from his cleaning frenzy creating a plume in his wake as he races toward the explosion, calling for his guards as he goes. He yells back over his shoulder to you. Don't just stand there, Silas. Let's go. You stumble into a run to follow the sheriff, nervously picking your way through the halls as mortal officers pop out of the woodwork to join you in the hunt. You're astonished at how easy it was to play key for a fool. Son of a bitch. Key slams his fist into a filing cabinet, sending it to the other end of the room with a crash. At least a year's worth of paperwork slowly floats down through the air around him as he seethes with impotent rage. It was almost amazing how easily Ward's plan worked. The distraction was a credible threat after all, and while the sheriff gathered his biggest guns to investigate, Ward and two of his allies broke into the cells and incapacitated the four police officers left on guard. By the time Key realized what was going on, it was far too late. I should have known, he says. I should have known the explosion was a distraction. There's too much crap going on at once. You really should start delegating more, sir, one of Key's companions says softly. This isn't going to be a good look. She shuffles nervously as the sheriff glares at her. We've, we've got to be practical. Key slumps down in his chair. Of course. You take point on this forward business, Carla. I'm too close to it. I'm making mistakes and I have too many other issues demanding my attention. He looks over at you. I don't suppose there's any chance you could frame this in anything other than an embarrassing light to your sire? There's going to be hell to pay. I'll do my best to paint you in a good light, but none of this is really your fault. Well, that's kind of you to say, he says. Hopefully Corliss will believe it if she hears it from you. 
you can't remember ever seeing him look this defeated. Hopefully he'll get his act together fast and return to his usual self. You may have agreed to help Ward out there, but that doesn't necessarily mean you want the entire institution to come crumbling down around you. Does it? It's getting close to dawn, Silas. He says. You should go back home and get some rest. I have a feeling it's going to be a busy night tomorrow. You nod in agreement. It's hard to argue with him, and if you don't get going now, you'll be stuck sleeping in the station's emergency shelters in the basement below. Not exactly the way you'd want to spend your day. You say your goodbyes and make your way back to your haven as quickly as possible, all the while fighting with yourself internally over your own motivations. In the end, you decide to sleep on it. Since the night of your embrace, dreams have largely eluded you as you slumber during the day in your luxurious bed. Rare exceptions to this rule occur on days of particular import, as well as when you are recovering from physical trauma. It's simple to recognize the dream for what it is, and as always the confused dreamscape narrative is an unsolvable riddle, offering incoherent glimpses at your past life and the formative years of your undeath. Fragments of memory coalesce into a scene from your first year after your embrace, as your sire inducted you into the high society of the local Camarilla. It is far from a pleasant memory. Corliss had been a taskmaster, driving your learning with ruthless efficiency. She made it clear to you from your very first night that the result of failure would be termination. As with any sire, Corliss favored particular lessons, pressing you to excel at very specific skills. Manipulation, charisma, and ooh. Okay. So this is where we can rise up in other aspects, too. Now, we learned this with um, Out for Blood, that being a master, like a jack of all trades, rarely helped. And some and you had to be kind of a master of individual stuff. But man, this could really go somewhere. Manipulation, charisma, and let me, let me check this out here. Manipulation, Charisma, and Wits. Our Wits are, is pretty good. But I don't think... Bones ache from intense physical discipline. Strength, Dex, and Stam. The classics. Um... Intelligence, Wits, and Composure. Or composure. And then Dex, Manipulation, and Resolve. Our dex is already at 47. I'm kind of okay with that. So maybe... Man, I'm not sure which one to go with here. Intense physical discipline from the very beginning. Corliss had me trained by the finest warriors. Uh, lessons to understand both the world around me as well as kindred culture. Spy. Do we want to go? I need your I need your opinion, guys, in the chat. I'm thinking that we need to go. You know, I have rarely ever gone combat based in these. But um I'm thinking about either the intelligence, wits, and composure route, or the dex manipulation and resolve. So are we like learned? Do, do we go through our teachings, or did we, like, really focus on being a spy? Which would be the best, do you think? This is really focusing around those two. Intelligence. And our composure is already 43. I don't know. I, I don't know what what path he's going to go right now. Do not know. Intelligence, wits, or composure. So intelligence is at 20. Wits and composure. Our composure would probably go up pretty high. Or Dex Manipulation and Resolve. 
our resolve is at 34, our dex is at 47, and our manipulation is at 30. So I guess is the question, do we want to focus on stuff we're already good at, or do we want to kind of make up we're kind of too far gone to buff mental? Yeah, let's go full spy. We'll see what happens. Elaborate and multifaceted, lasting several years before I was deemed suitable for the task. You will learn not only how to blend in with the shadows, Corliss said, but to blend in with the crowd. Focus on social engineering are an integral to a spy's toolkit as the ability to move about unseen. Even though they were they were said decades ago, in the dream, your sire's words ring as clearly as they had the first day you'd learned them. I still need to figure out Corliss's voice, so I apologize if it's like all over the place. Say what you will about Eden Corliss, and there are a great many things to say, both good and bad. But she hadn't kicked you out of the nest without preparing you for an undead life among the deadliest, most manipulative creatures in existence. No, it was more than that. She hadn't simply prepared you to survive their constant tests and political attacks. She made you one of them. Did she see you going soft as you languished alongside the Ivory Tower elites? Is that why she sent you out to fight against Robert Ward and his band of Anarchs after years spent in the safety of her cage and your extravagant haven? You twist uncomfortably in your luxurious bed as you remember the early days when you were required to procure your own meals. Stock mortals. Drown out their fear and screams as blood surged through your body in a heady euphoria of revitalization. You've grown complacent. Docile. The predator had been stripped from you, but now you are awake again. And you're hungry. Ooh. So let's look at our stats now. Our dex is at 54. Resolve at 40, Composure. I mean, our social attributes seem to be okay. Our intelligence is rock bottom. But, uh... We just need to make sure we don't take any hits. We know that we are not seen. But we should definitely feed soon, because our hunger is at 3. And we move on to the next chapter, guys. So, um... We tried to make an ally of the Ventru. She was having none of it. Um, we did get some information from her, though. That was quite interesting. And then we ran into Ward again and assisted with the uh, bombing of a jail facility. So I'm not exactly sure what side Silas is on. I think he's just kind of going with the flow and seeing what happens. But, um, you know, we want to make powerful friends, but we never said what faction they were going to be for. So I guess we'll have to figure this out as the story goes along. But um, that was chapter two, and we will go ahead and check out chapter three in the next stream. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you haven't followed the Twitch channel, please do so. I try and stream on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays with random times in between. And if you are watching the replay of this on YouTube, I have a link to the Twitch channel in the description below, as well as the link to this game Steam page if you want to play the game yourself and a link to my Extra Life page um, if you would like to um, donate there where I'm raising money for my local children's hospital via the Extra Life charity. So check out those links if you feel so inclined. Like, share, subscribe, you guys know the drill there. And we will see you next time. Later days, everyone.